Hey guys, in this video we're going to be going over community level systems for your OCR Gateway GCSE in Biology or Combined Science. Now to go with this video, over on the site you can download the free revision guide and you can just check off the topics once we've done them and then find out which topics you're not really very comfortable with and go and revise those. The water cycle is much more complicated than you think it is going to be. Heat energy from the sun comes down, warms the surface of the water on the earth, and this is going to cause the water to evaporate. As the water evaporates, it's going to become less dense, it's going to rise up, and then it's going to condense when it starts to cool down. This is when we're going to get clouds formed. When the clouds are heavy, when the water has accumulated so much, it is going to start to rain, and the fancy word for rain is precipitation. After it's rained, the water is going to do a number of things. It can go into the mountains where it will sink in or percolate deep into the mountains where it's then going to pick up stuff like irons, salts, um, which is going to affect the, the taste and the chemistry of the water. This will then come out somewhere as a little stream and go into the river. Some of it's going to go into the soil, moving slowly back towards um, a river or a lake as through flow. Some of the water will go straight onto the ground. If the rock or the mud is already saturated, if it is full of water or the rock is impermeable, then that will just run off into the nearest river or stream or lake or reservoir. All of it ending up at some point in a large collection of water, whether that is in the sea again, or whether that's in a reservoir, or whether that's in a lake. Some of that water will get taken up by plants and used in photosynthesis. It will also come out of plants in a process of transpiration. And then go up into make clouds, and then the cycle can start all over again. So for the carbon cycle, I'm referring a lot to organic compounds. And if you haven't heard this phrase before, it can be a bit confusing. Organic compounds are just any compound that has carbon in it. And just to remind you, a compound is two or more elements that are chemically bonded together. So here are all the different locations that carbon can be. It can be carbon dioxide in the air, or carbon dioxide can be dissolved in oceans. It can be as organic compounds in plants or in animals. These organic compounds can also be present in the dead plants and animals, and they are in fossil fuels. Now you need to know the various different ways that they change um, um, from all these different locations and what the processes are called. So let's start with fossil fuels. When we have fossil fuels, we can burn them so that the carbon in them goes into the air. And the fancy name for this is combustion. When the carbon dioxide is in the air, it can be taken up by plants. And this is a process of photosynthesis. And the opposite can occur as well, because plants will also undergo respiration. Plants get eaten by animals. And then plants and animals both die.
from the um, organic compounds that are in the dead um, plants and animals. They can turn into fossil fuels by either either being buried or being sedimented, or they can just go straight back up into the air by the process of decay. And then lastly, our animals are also undergoing respiration. So carbon isn't a static thing. It is constantly moving around from carbon dioxide in the air to carbon compounds that are in animals, plants, in dead animals, and then being inserted into fossil fuels, which can then be burnt and put the carbon dioxide back in the air. This is a very, very complicated, involved process that happens over millions of years, and you need to know all of these steps. An ecosystem are the animals, plants, everything living within a certain area. The community are the plants and animals that live there. And they're all dependent upon one another. They cannot survive without each other. For example, the animals eat the plants. They can't survive without doing that. And the plants rely on the animals to distribute their seeds. To survive and reproduce, a species needs food, water, air, and sometimes, but not always, a mate. Abiotic and biotic factors are things that are going to affect any organism. Abiotic are non-living factors, such as light intensity, temperature, water levels, pH, iron levels, wind, carbon dioxide levels, and oxygen levels. Biotic factors are going to be living factors such as food, predators and pathogens. An increase or reduction or removal or introduction of any of these factors can have a dramatic impact on a community. For example, the introduction of a new predator or a new pathogen could wipe out a community. An increase or a decrease in the temperature could mean that the, an organism's food source is gone or an organism can't survive in that environment. And plants and animals aren't going to be able to survive without sufficient levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen. Microorganisms are part of the system of biotics and abiotic factors that help break down old things, for example, old food, so that the components can be recycled back through the system. Decay and decomposition are breaking down of organic matter, and this generally happens by microorganisms. And microorganisms are alive, and this is what we need to think about when we are looking at how temperature, water and oxygen affect the levels of decay. They are not going to work at very, very low temperatures. They are going to have a rather narrow set of temperatures which they are going to want to work in. They rely on enzymes to break things down. They are going to slowly be increasing their, um, how, how well they work as the temperature increases. But then at a certain point, the enzymes are going to nature, so it's going to come quite steeply down. And if it gets too hot, the whole thing's going to catch on fire. Very similar with the level of water, it's going to be slowly increasing as it gets uh, wetter and then past a certain point the bacteria just aren't going to be able to cope. They need to have oxygen, they need to be able to respire and if there's too much water they just can't do that. 
oxygen, there is a very narrow amount of oxygen that they will be able to use. Um, without oxygen, they can't do anything, and too much oxygen, then it starts to become toxic. In the garden, gardeners can compost things so that they can get rid of their um, unwanted things and then take the nutrients, the goodies in there and put them back onto the garden. Compost is going to get rather hot as this goes on and it's going to get rather smelly and gas is going to be released and this gas can be harvested and used. All food chains start in the same place with the sun providing energy. And then from this energy, things are going to grow, mainly plants, and they get eaten by other things. Whether it's um, grass being eaten by cows and then going on to be eaten by us, or whether we eat the plants directly, or whether the plants hear the corn is being turned into corn syrup, which is used in ketchup. Whether we eat them directly or process them, we are a top consumer. Whereas other things like cows are going to be herbivores because they just eat plants. The direction of the arrow is really important in food chains. Direction of the arrow means eaten by. When we are looking at food chains, we can also think about constructing pyramids, either pyramids of numbers or pyramids of biomass. Each of these are trophic levels, and when we're doing numbers, you just need to look at the number of things that eat the thing below it. And biomass, we need to take into account the number and the mass of the stuff that's being eaten. As we jump between trophic levels, roughly 10% of energy is transferred from one to the other. It is going to be lost in a number of different ways. Respiration. Waste, as in um, urea and faeces. Movement, running around, jumping, doing normal animal things. Ouch. Mm, love you too, Krim.